membership fees range from approximately fifteen thousand up to three hundred thousand. And a lawyer. I said, "Do you love her?" He said, "Yes." And I said, "Do you trust her?" Well, he said, "Let's just say there will be a prenup." They have prenups. They have midnups. They have postnups. They have all. It's all. It's already all contractually arranged. Oh yes, billionaire love and marriage goes together like divorce and disparage. A man will marry and then be taken to the cleaners, and then marry again and be taken to the cleaners. <laughs> Don't even think about getting married. True love is definitely possible if you're very, very rich, but not if you base your relationship on your status as a rich person. Love is a battlefield even for the mere mortal, and the billionaire has so much more to lose. London is billionaire central. 105 of them call the UK home. They can buy anything they want, but the one thing they want for free can have a very high price tag. That is to love and be loved. Choosing a partner is the riskiest investment they will ever make, because the city streets are paved with gold diggers. If you have something that other people want, you will create an atmosphere of envy, and that's what they live with. Who's real, who isn't? It's a nightmare, because they can never really trust anybody. They're always feeling that they might be exploited by gold diggers, or people who don't think they're gold diggers, but actually turn out to be gold diggers in the end. 89% of those with a net worth of over 100 million pounds are men. So the odds of success favor female gold diggers. Most of the over nine millionaires in the UK are women who marry rich men. And within five years, you know, walked away with 50 million. Men being men, they are attracted to a good looking girl. For them, it's equivalent to a woman having a, a particular designer luxury handbag. You know, their, their major accessory is what they have on their arm. Following a few top tips can make becoming a rich man's arm candy a piece of cake. You do have to look good, but less is more. And to look elegant is more important than to just to show it or, you know, have everything on display. If you want to nab, you know, a, a male super rich man, um, the first thing you do is you have to hook him on sex. And when a man is absolutely deliriously, you know, sexually high, he's unlikely to ask for any sort of financial arrangement because it might put you off sex immediately. You do need to have a certain amount of intelligence. So you do need to read the newspapers or keep up. But at the same time, don't keep giving your opinion. Always be a good listener. Because if you're a good listener and always agree to everything, well, you get on a lot better with men, I find. Rather than having a, a two-way dialogue, conversation, flirting, thinking how they can make the other person feel good, they're often only able to talk about themselves. There's one way the super rich man can guarantee a beautiful woman will hang on his every word. Reward her. There are plenty of websites designed to help. You can have all the money in the world, but if you don't have anyone to share it with, what's the use? When you use seeking arrangement for the billionaires, all they've got to do is click a couple of buttons and voila, you've got your ideal woman. Seeking Arrangement is one website that offers to bring together 700,000 sugar daddies and 2.6 million sugar babies. A sugar daddy is usually an older man who works as a CEO, executive, um, clearly has additional income to spend on a relationship. And a sugar baby is usually a young, ambitious woman who is looking for financial assistance or nice gifts from a man to kind of advance herself, to afford herself the same lifestyle that he has. The guys on the site are very worldly, you know, they've travelled, um, you don't get the riffraff of society, <laughs> I don't think I'm asking for too much, 100,000 minimum. I'm fed up with the scrounging men and the layabouts and the, the guys that are really not ambitious. Former sugar baby Helen Croydon used seeking arrangement for three years. 
There's a tacit agreement here that it is the girl who's going to slot into the man's busy life. They can say things such as, you know, I only want to see you during the weekends. Which I think is a very honest way of saying I haven't got the time or the emotional uh, capacity to invest in a full-time conventional sort of relationship. A lot of the guys will offer, um, you know, luxury gifts, so perfume or designer handbags, could be shopping trips, um, help, help with your rent as well. The nicest gift I received um, has to be this Cartier diamond ring. But presents from super rich men can shift to cold cash. I remember there was <laughs> one um, man, and he'd always insist on buying me something fabulous, and I didn't really need anything more. And I'd always go and take it back and then just keep the money. <laughs> and I think he eventually realized I did this, and he said, Oh, God, why didn't you say? I'll just give you the money. The form of financial assistance usually comes in a monthly allowance. And the average monthly allowance is about £3,000. One day I did accept cash. And it was, you know, two years, actually, of me questioning the morals of that and thinking, oh, my gosh, girls like me don't do this. The media has been quick to judge these relationships and say that, oh, well, all these billionaires are just paying for high-class prostitutes. For an escort, you pay them to leave. For a sugar baby, you're paying them to stay. But are sugar babies just expensive arm candy? Or is there more involved in keeping a rich man sweet? I think just like anyone else, they had a need, a, a sort of a romantic need to spend some intimate time with one person. Sex is part of that. It's not about having sex with somebody and getting paid for it. It's about providing a certain relationship and having the chance to share their wealth. There was one man who I had dinner with once, and he said that the reason he had these sorts of um, compensated relationships was because it was cheaper than getting a wife. Coming up... So nice to meet you. <laughs> ...how the services of a matchmaker can save the billionaire bacon. If you're sitting across the room from a gold digger, trust me, they tell you that they want a man with money. So it's very easy for us <laughs> to screen out gold diggers. And just married, subject to contract, of course. For the super rich, it can be incredibly important to have a prenup. It's not exactly um, Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers romance time. We're talking serious legal agreements. It's the one thing that makes you feel absolutely sure that you're being married for love. Oh, thank you. Billionaires can buy pretty much anything they want, except the big one, true love. Yes, gold diggers and sugar babies flock to date them, expecting their gifts and hoping to marry them, perhaps. But real love is elusive. It's no wonder that some billionaires are prepared to spend hundreds of thousands of pounds on the services of matchmakers to keep ne'er-do-wells at arm's length. If you're sitting across the room from a gold digger, trust me, they tell you that they want a man with money. So it's very easy for us <laughs> to screen out gold diggers. Based in San Francisco. CEO Amber Kelleher and her team help the super rich, both men and women, stay safe while searching for love. They can't go online because once you put who you really are, you can be um, searched immediately. You can go onto Google, you can find out someone's um, income. To not work with a professional matchmaker, is, is, it, it's a no-brainer. We have two new elite clients that are on hold together and exploring a relationship. <laughs> so the billion dollar question, how much does it cost to keep gold diggers at bay? The membership fees range from approximately 15000 up to 300000 It depends on how many offices you want working for you, how many countries you want. We have 10,000 on average people apply per year, and we work with 200 of them. We have a phenomenal woman that's come on board. She was referred by one of our most important relationships. Amber's small, carefully selected client base has equal numbers of men and women. But although women make up just 10% of the global super-rich, they represent 80% of those applying to be taken on by Amber. 
that could be very um, shocking maybe for people to hear. You think, my goodness, don't you work for all the wealthy men? Um, we would if they were smart enough to call us. <laughs> but this is Carolina, and how do you, how do you pronounce your last name so that I don't... It's complicated. Carolina Zazinyak. What are two things that you can share with us that you're excited about? Carolina is a former professional tennis player who started a couple of businesses and then invested very wisely. Sometimes I'm wondering if the men that I'm dating are more interested in, you know, uh, what I'm worth or um, some of the contacts that I may have. You know, there's always that wonder if they're interested in you for the right reasons. It may be deemed socially acceptable for a super rich man to marry a beautiful, younger and poorer woman, but it's not for a super rich woman to do the same. So the pool of potential partners is significantly reduced. Is it that we know the gentleman first that appeals to you or just the fact that maybe you're no longer in charge of your dating life and we're taking over? <laughs> Carolina is joining an elite matchmaking club. But there's another section that's even more exclusive. Well, we have what's called the CEO club, and just 10 people per year are able to become part of this elite group. And they pay 150,000 to be part of the group, and then there's a success fee that matches that. 43-year-old David Boyer is someone Amber is thinking about inviting into the CEO club. He made his millions working for McKinsey and eBay. So nice to meet you. Just wait. <laughs> Thank you for, you know. Now, with great financial stability, he's looking for a long term love. Uh, well, clearly, I'm looking for somebody uh, who's fun and funny and attractive and intelligent, and who, when I talk to them, actually they get a sparkle in their eye. It's, it's the best friend that I'm looking for. The Wingtip, an exclusive social club with a boutique attached, is just one place Amber takes her top clients. Hi, David. Well, if you're an elite client and you join the CEO club where I personally work with you, I'll be at the TED conference, I will be at Sundance, I will be having private events on Necker Island. I am always looking for that special someone that could be a perfect match for my client. And the client determines what the level of success is. It's not just necessarily about that marriage certificate. Happily ever after for the prudent billionaire means riding off into the sunset with the one. But first, making sure the paperwork's in place before any peeling of wedding bells. All you have to do to make millions overnight is marry a rich man and then divorce him and take his money. I think the advice that I would give to somebody who is spectacularly wealthy, who's living here, is don't even think about getting married. Formidable divorce lawyer Raymond Tooth known as Jaws, fights for the wives of the rich and famous. I say this, and I hope I don't get any hate mail. The fact is that the best career for a woman is to marry a wealthy man without a prenup. I mean, there was a famous case where a man was worth about 20-odd million. The marriage lasted three years, no children. She came into it with nothing and ended up with five million quid. Five million quid, tax-free. Billionaires who want to avoid being the get-rich-quick scheme for a prospective wife or husband need a prenuptial contract. A legal agreement that determines how the wealth will be divided if the marriage goes to pot. They're also handy for preventing arguments about which partner gets to keep tricky woo, and in one case even dictated the final destination of a taxidermied horse. For the super rich, it can be incredibly important to have a prenup because it's the one thing that makes you feel absolutely sure that you're being married for love. Aisha Vardag is a top lawyer known as the diva of divorce. And that's in the chronology. It's been served online yeah. and everything about the so they know that it was all after the separation. In 2010, she won a landmark case that strengthened UK prenups and brought them in line with Europe and the rest of the world. So, as she marries for the second time, she's practicing what she preaches. The happy couple have already gifted themselves a prenup. We both wanted to organize our affairs so that in the event that we parted, what we had built up beforehand was safeguarded for our children from our previous lives. 
Like all blushing brides and grooms, their wedding day is a celebration of pure and undiminishable love. And there's a lawyer's flourish, too. <laughs> to be really, really sure their prenup is watertight, they are signing it post-nup in front of all their guests. There are lots of things that people don't want to talk about money, they don't want to talk about problems, they want to sweep lots of things under the carpet. Having gone through and dealt with all of that, we felt made our marriage much stronger. Oh, thank you. Mm. So that was why we had the, uh, the post-nut then and there, along with the, the cake, really to celebrate the fact that our marriage was very much a partnership of equals. But when it's not a marriage of equals, prenups can have a nasty habit of accelerating divorce. If you start analysing what is going to happen when your marriage breaks down, you kind of almost inject into your marriage a kind of death wish. I had a client recently, uh, he's met a younger woman, he's been divorced. I said, do you love her? He said, yes. And I said, do you trust her? Well, he said, let's just say there will be a prenup. So you have all the lawyers come in already before you've even started the relationship, dividing out who would have what, and you're only getting this. So, you know, if you do this, if you're unfaithful, you're not going to get this. You know, it, it is all mapped out before, and I just think that it, there goes the romance out the window. In the billionaire world, hanging on to your riches often means jettisoning the chance of romance. Not for American comic Roseanne Barr. She was so in love with Tom Arnold before their 1990 wedding that she fired her attorney for suggesting she sign a prenup. When the couple divorced four years later, Arnold left with $50 million. But if love doesn't last forever, neither, it seems, do prenups. General Electric CEO Jack Welch's prenup had a sunset clause, which meant that after 10 years, the prenup was invalid. As soon as this clause came into effect, his wife Jane took off with $150 million. But most of the time, with a prenup in hand, the billionaire is reasonably safe to put a ring on his fiancée's finger without chancing his arm. Coming up, the breathtaking weddings of the super rich. There was a wedding recently where the total dress bill was 16 million pounds. A few weeks ago, we did a wedding where, for 50 guests, the bride wanted 13 wedding cakes. And the harsh come down as the reality of being married to the hyper wealthy takes hold. What I usually see is that nobody is good enough. Things are not perfect enough. And the amount of unfaithfulness not just by men, but by women, is extraordinary. If a billionaire believes they finally found a trustworthy mate, it's time to show off their success with an extremely extravagant wedding. But impressing your billionaire peers can be hard work. We have brides now wanting to get married at the top of a volcano and actually flying their guests up there or getting married on a glacier and actually getting their guests transported by private jet to... ...glaciers. There's almost this one upmanship that's going on. There's pretty much nowhere left where somebody hasn't got married. I've heard of a bride recently, they literally hired the whole of Versailles for the weekend. The Vatican, all the famous museums, the top of mountains, you know, everywhere's been done. Bride Magazine recommends couples put aside a year for their wedding preparations. Time to safely complete 44 key tasks. For the super rich, there is almost no end to the demands. One wedding that I heard of recently, which I thought was absolutely phenomenal, was they actually installed a perspex layer into a lake so all the guests could actually walk on water. We might get a request for something slightly different, like an entire orchestra, for example, or a ballet, for example, which has happened on two or three occasions. You have everything from elephants to flamingos to penguins, and I've heard of a wedding recently where they literally dressed up a troop of horses as unicorns. Sometimes it's about holding people back. I mean, it's not appropriate to arrive on an elephant in the middle of London. Wedding bells, wedding bells. 
the biggest show of all is the wedding dress. There was a wedding recently where the bride herself and all her bridesmaids, or Vera Wang, bespoke, and the total dress bill was £16 million. As the average price of a London home is half a million pounds, these dresses would buy 32 addresses in the capital. The super rich certainly have their cake and eat it. I think one of the most incredible cakes I've ever made was an 18-tier cake. The cake ended up being um, about 8 foot tall. It had about 10,000 sugar flowers on it. So, and that involved um, six people working constantly on that cake for a month. Uh, the most expensive cake we have ever um, commissioned cost us nearly £46,000, mainly to do with the fact that we flew the cake maker and her kitchen to another part of the world. We've certainly used edible 24 karat gold um, a number of times on our cakes. It really doesn't taste of anything and it's just very decadent. I think it's the, the sheer opulence of it, the fact that you can eat gold. You so, cakes are worth their weight in gold, but they're cheap compared to the cost of hiring a platinum-selling superstar. Enrique Iglesias, for example, we were asked to get him on a Monday for a wedding on a Friday. Uh, I heard recently that Michael Bublé played at a wedding for a million pounds. The demand for these, for these performers has gone up. Their price has gone up, so it's now stratospheric money. And then when they turn up, they're not going to do two hours, they're going to do 20 minutes. It's hard work being a guest at a super rich wedding. Now there are weddings that are lasting literally seven to ten days, involving you know thousands and thousands of guests, several days of feasting. Those can be quite challenging because and they can be quite tiring for guests because eating fabulous food and gorgeous champagnes and eating lots of seafood and caviar, it can get quite weary for people. <laughs> But there are rich pickings to perk up the guests who can expect a little more than sugared almonds. There was a groom and bride who wanted to do an amazing gift and they gave each one of them a Rolex watch. And so the Rolex watch was incorporated into um, each of the bouquets for these 500 female guests. I think the most opulent or extravagant gift we've ever seen given was a small wedding for a group of Asians, there are 22 of them, I think, and they were all given the keys to a car. £18,000 is the cost of an average British wedding. For billionaires, that could be the cost of just one goodie bag. I think you could take the Kim Kardashian wedding and actually triple that, times it by 10, and I think we would still not get anywhere close to what the super rich are doing right now. Kim Kardashian's wedding to Kanye West is estimated to have cost $10 million. It would have taken eight of these to add up to the most expensive wedding of all time. As far back as 2004, Venetia Mittal and Amit Bhatia managed to spend $78 million. Twelve Boeing jets were hired to fly guests from India to France. Festivities went on for six days, but... After less than 10 years together, they separated. A result that wouldn't surprise the researchers, who in a recent survey of 3,000 couples found that the more spent on a wedding, the greater the chance of divorce. Money makes life easy. Being ultra-rich, I don't really know how easy that is. I'd like to see how long those relationships last. <laughs> A dream wedding becomes a nightmare marriage, especially fast for the bride who discovers her groom is not the man she thought he was. Uh, a couple were set up, and she went and Googled him, and basically saw a slew of businesses, net worth, rich list, and, and said, oh, okay, great. Anyway, they were married within a, you know, a couple of weeks. Anyway, it turned out that she'd Googled the wrong person and that there was another person with exactly the same name who did exactly the same. It was a very, very common name. And by the time she found out that she'd married the wrong guy, she was married. So anyway, that marriage didn't last very long. Problem two, a successful fortune hunter may want an early return on their investment. In, in a relationship with billionaires, obviously all the hard work happens before the marriage. Now in ordinary marriages, um, the relationship, the, the courting is the fun bit. You're in love, you're having a great time. The work comes in when you get married. What I think is different amongst the billionaires and the super rich marriages 
is that that's when you stop working. You've got the bank account. If you walk away from the marriage, you've got what you wanted. If you didn't want the man in the first place, why invest any work into the relationship? Even the wives who married for love do well to live happily ever after. Sometimes they'll discover their prince has turned into a despot. If you have financial wealth, you can really get into things having to be a certain way. You know, there's that old um, saying, he who has the gold makes the rules. They can't understand that we might give them a, ba a boundary or say you can't do this. I don't know what you mean you can't do this. I, 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 I do anything I want is the approach, you know. I am master of the universe. When they're in the office, everybody thinks they're wonderful. And when they go home, their wife thinks they're just the same as they always were, mediocre as all the rest of us. I have seen such thumping narcissism amongst very rich men that they do actually believe that they are fascinating. And as my husband often says, you know, the richer the person, the more they think their, their opinions are valid. The men that I've coached, they are people who are, have everyone say yes to them. So I might just want to go hunting and shooting today. Women have to fall into line. They're expected to be like add-ons to their lifestyle. So they're there when they want them and they're not there when they don't want them. At first, wealthy wives are happy to take a back seat if they've got a chauffeur in the front. But the joys of luxury living have their limits. If you have everything, you have housekeepers, you have nannies, you have dog walkers, you have personal trainers, what do you do all day long? The women get to know how to amuse themselves with shopping, spa treatments, surgery, holidays, girls' night outs, all the things that women might like to do. Women are not as happily employed during the day as they think they will be just by having access to these huge resources and houses and, uh, and holidays and all the rest of it. So they're not in themselves the answer to the human being's deepest longings. One American survey found that men with an income of over $300,000 were 10% more unfaithful than those earning less than $35,000. So, many a wealthy wife will spend her time, and his money, trying to postpone their sell-by date. The women know that their job is to be uh, entertaining and to look fabulous all the time, hence the rise in surgery. So, as you get older, you're an aging model, so hence you get the kind of wind tunnel effect start happening, and eventually that runs out, and then they get a new model. And the amount of unfaithfulness, not just by men, but by women, is extraordinary. You have to take a lot if you're the wife of somebody very rich and powerful because you know he might have mistresses and you have to be very cool about that. There's so much sex around you. I mean, it's, it's a completely different world. 42% of ultra-high net worth men will divorce, so there's almost a one in two chance of success. There isn't that real attempt to be faithful and to try to do the best and have an argument, right, I'll get divorced. It, it's it's uh, very sad, actually, to be honest. What I usually see is that nobody is good enough. Things are not perfect enough. And I often feel like, wow, you know, it seems like if you had been assertive and talked about it, that it's perhaps something that could have been worked out. The fact of the matter is, that people do not make enough effort to save their marriages. If there are no financial consequences to leaving that relationship, then you leave. Coming up, when marriage breaks down and there's no prenup, divorce is the quickest way for the super rich to lose a fortune. People are going to fight a lot harder over a hundred million dollars than they are going to fight over a thousand dollars. The long-term consequences of going through these very high-conflict divorces should not be underestimated. And one super-rich divorcee counts the cost. I think our marriage was a mistake. And I think uh, we should have realized sooner than later. Huge money makes it hard for a billionaire to find the perfect partner. But easy to get rid of an imperfect wife. If you're really rich, it's like bang, 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 it's over. They can divorce like that. They have prenups, they have midnups, they have postnups, they have all it's all it's already all contractually arranged. So just when when the rift happens, it can be executed quite fast. 
Without a legal agreement, divorce is very bad news for billionaire bank accounts. The wealth itself amplifies the problems. I mean, people are going to fight a lot harder over a hundred million dollars than they are going to fight over a thousand dollars. London's divorce courts used to favor billionaires. Awards were according to need, not about equal division of assets. Then there was this massive sea change in 2000 when uh, White and White went to the House of Lords, which is now the Supreme Court, and the judges made it very clear no distinction between homemaker and breadwinner, and the starting point for division of assets would be 50-50. At the same time as that happened, we had a complete explosion in the wealth of London. Bankers, hedge fund managers, insurance, lawyers, accountants, and all the panoply that goes with it, making huge amounts of money, miles, miles more than they used to make. The wives of the super-rich and their lawyers were the new winners as London became the divorce capital of the world. There was a sense that people were just sort of staying married as passengers and they might be lunching out and spending their days having tennis coaches and having their children cared for wall-to-wall -wall by nannies and then they sort of go off with some dashing young lover and take half of the fortune. One billionaire loser is Bernie Eccleston, CEO of the Formula One Group. His strong views on the equality of women became clear in 2005 when he said, in relation to IndyCar racer Danica Patrick, you know, I've got one of those wonderful ideas. Women should be dressed in white like all the other domestic appliances. Four years later in 2009, the British courts valued Slavica, his wife of 23 years, rather more highly and awarded her 2.4 billion pounds, around half of Bernie's estimated fortune. Such eye-watering awards encourage discontented wives the world over to flock to London. There are countries where if the case is heard at home, they'll get nothing. A wife will get nothing. The consequences for a wife who gets divorced in, in a Muslim country usually is that she gets nothing or virtually nothing. So um, there's a huge stake, so far as she's concerned, in getting a case heard here. To have their divorce cases heard in the UK, foreign wives need to prove their British credentials. Specific instances that I've seen have included you know, ladies who don't speak English buying theatre tickets to you know, English language productions. Um, sending children under the age of 10 to learn how to ride polo ponies, um, to study a uh, 14-year-old who was sent on flying lessons in Surrey, you know, in order to try and say, here, these children are becoming more English than the English. When former Malaysian beauty queen Pauline Chai was divorcing the multimillionaire chairman of Laura Ashley, she claimed that keeping more than 1,000 pairs of shoes in her Hertfordshire estate proved the UK was her permanent home. But becoming British does not always mean playing with a straight bat. I heard a great story of a friend married to um, a super rich Russian mogul, um, and their marriage was coming to an end. Um, but she was a bit savvier about the English court system, so she went and hired every single divorce lawyer in the UK, including Fiona Shackleton and, and all of this, and basically put them on retainer. When you put a lawyer on retainer, he is not allowed, or she is not allowed to act for the other side. So by the time her kind of fairly dim-witted husband got around to hiring her lawyer, there were none left in England. Anyway, she walked out with one of the best divorce packages I've ever seen. And super-rich men have a divorce tactic of their very own. Most of the super-rich become very un-super-rich when they get divorced. Um, you will find people who were, you know, steel industrialists are now, they become school teachers overnight. And you become a school teacher for the entire year you're getting divorced and then you go back to being a steel magnate. So when you're divorcing, you only have 10,000 pounds salary. And that's, that's the, the new trick. Not hiding your wealth under a bushel results in astonishing divorce payouts. The top payout of all time was in 2014. Elena Ribolovleva, wife of Russian fertilizer king Dmitry, reaped a bumper harvest of $4.8 billion, more than half of his estimated fortune of $8.8 .8 billion. 
But coming up on the inside track to smash this record is a divorce payout that means oil tycoon Harold Hamm is lining up to be the billionaire with the biggest wad to lose. He's worth 20.2 billion, and so, even if his wife Sue is awarded only a quarter of his fortune, she'll become the richest divorcee of all time. They become, on both sides, utterly obsessed with the result and winning, even if they're going to end up with a lot anyway, not getting the last few million. Women may be entitled to half their husband's money, but how much is he really worth? If somebody is absolutely determined to have assets all over the world in a network of companies and trusts, it's going to be very hard to find them. In July 2010, there was a court decision that made this even harder. Lisa Chengiz was born in Tehran and arrived in London when she was 13. She has always been surrounded by wealth. You know, this world is very colorful. It's very attractive. So it's, it's very easy for a beautiful girl to want to be a part of it. In 2001, on the super-rich party circuit, she met Vivian Immerman. He was a food and drinks magnate known as the Man from Del Monte. He sold his stake in the fruit giant for 380 million pounds in 1999. And two years later, he became Lisa's second husband. We were married within eight months, so it was very quick. It was very quick. We didn't really have time to get to know each other. It's a glamorous world. It's easy to like it and love it, but you're not actually loving the person. You're loving the, what comes with it. After living together in London for seven years, the couple separated. I think our marriage was a mistake. And I think uh, we should have realized sooner than later. There's lo a lot more ties between the father and his ex-family. So one day, I guess, he must have woken up and thought, I want to go back home. I didn't feel like home to him. Lisa's marriage finally broke down in 2008. Her brothers became her main source of support. Mr. Immerman shared an office with the Chengiz brothers. They took the view that they would see whether they could find on his computer evidence that he had more money than he was claiming during the process of the divorce. Uh, they went about getting access to his computer improperly and downloading everything on it. Masses of documents. It wasn't one little bank account. It was everything. Lisa Chengiz's brothers uh, were alleged by Mr. Immerman to have removed between 250,000 and two and a half million pages of documents, which they then handed on to lawyers for use in the family proceedings. While Lisa sued for 120 million pounds, Vivian Immerman countersued for breach of confidence. The Court of Appeal were dealing with the most spectacular example of self-help that I think it's possible to ever imagine. And they said, quite simply and very boldly, no, not in our courts. So it has become far more difficult, I think, for wives to quietly, but probably improperly, to have a look at their husband's documents behind their back. Wives have to be far more careful than they used to be. Lisa still had a luxurious lifestyle, and so she decided to settle for 15 million pounds. It had been a five-year legal fight, and now with a new partner, she knows what it takes to live happily ever after. Marry for love, not for money. That's really, really best advice I can give. For the super-rich, like the rest of us, there are no real winners in divorce. The long-term consequences of going through these very high-conflict divorces uh, should not be underestimated. And super-rich men rarely learn from past mistakes. They're reluctant to let go of the arm candy, the trophy wife concept. And we see the super-rich coming to us, maybe having been divorced six or seven times, and yet again wanting a clone of the previous relationship. I always find it quite curious that somebody, a, a man will marry and then be taken to the cleaners and then marry again and be taken to the cleaners. <laughs> it's just, I suppose, every time they think this time it'll work.
the ideal partner that you're looking for, um, because of the money that you've got, is going to make it more difficult for you to actually live a, a normal, natural life. There are always going to be attractive people making themselves available to you if you're very rich. With so many temptations to overcome, can the super-rich ever find true love? True love is definitely possible if you're very, very rich, but not if you base your relationship